Good evening. So glad you could join us. Tonight, Eugene Higgins will share the gospel while referencing the carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. My name is Glenn Todd, and I am your host for this series of messages. When I think of Bethlehem, I think about a town, and I think about residents in that town who had no idea what a momentous event was taking place within their precinct. Even though it was predicted hundreds of years before its occurrence. We read in the Old Testament and Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem, out of thee shall come forth a ruler, who has been from old to everlasting. And Isaiah the prophet, some six to seven hundred years before the birth of Christ, wrote these words, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. The Christmas carol speaks of that child, that son, being given a gift from God. Now let's listen to the carol as I share it with you. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming. But in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Now, here is Eugene Higgins. Good evening and welcome to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So nice to have you uh, joining us tonight and I hope God will bless his word to you as we consider his great gospel once more. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of thy son, our Lord Jesus, we bow in thy presence. We thank thee for allowing us to be able to uh, meet in this capacity, to communicate the gospel through this technology. And we humbly pray for thy blessing on thy word. We think of a world that is uh, passing through difficulty just now. And we pray that thou wilt have mercy on us and uh, be pleased, Lord, in the midst of this pandemic to grant that there might be relief and a cure found and a vaccine that would be uh, effective, be uh, able to be distributed. We commit this great need to thee and ask thy blessing. But just now, Lord, we are asking for help and blessing in connection with this meeting, praying that thou would be pleased to use thy word to bring men and women to thy Son for salvation. We ask this giving our thanks in the Savior's precious name. Amen. 
I'd like to read with you, first of all, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 49 says, None can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever, or it must be left alone. Then, in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Roman Christians, chapter 6 and verse 23, we read, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then there is a delightful expression used by Paul in the Second Corinthian epistle, chapter 9, and the last verse says, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. We're looking tonight at the very well-known carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. The author of this carol, Phillips Brook, was born on December 13, 1835 in Boston, Massachusetts. He was a member of an old wealthy New England family. He attended Harvard and taught briefly at the Boston Latin School before attending the Episcopal Seminary in Alexandria, Virginia. In August of 1859, he began his ministry at the Church of the Advent in Philadelphia, my hometown, where he became renowned as an eloquent preacher. He was known for his support of freeing the slaves and also allowing former slaves to vote. Three years later, he became rector of Philadelphia's Holy Trinity, and except for a year of travel abroad in 1865 and 66, he remained there seven years during which he finished the lyrics of his famous Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. His own eloquence was matched by his commanding figure, standing six feet four inches tall and in his prime weighing 300 pounds. His preaching became so renowned that he was invited in 1880 to preach at Westminster Abbey in London and at the Royal Chapel at Windsor before Queen Victoria. In 1865, Brooks visited Judea. He had traveled there following President Lincoln's assassination and the deaths of so many of his parishioners and other Americans in the American Civil War. He traveled on horseback from Jerusalem to Bethlehem and was inspired by the night view of Bethlehem from the surrounding hills. In Bethlehem, he assisted with the midnight service on that 1865 Christmas Eve. A few years later, Brooks wanted to write a new song for the Sunday School Children's Choir. And his mind went back to that memorable experience of seeing Bethlehem spread out before him, the little town. And he wrote about it. He said, I remember standing in the old church in Bethlehem, close to the spot where Jesus was born, when the whole church was ringing hour after hour with splendid hymns of praise to God. How again and again it seemed as if I could hear voices I knew well telling each other of the wonderful night of the Savior's birth. That all came back to him as he wanted to write this Christmas carol, and the words began to flow from his pen. He asked the organist Louis Redner to compose a simple melody for the children to sing on Christmas Eve. Mr. Redner sat down at the piano to find just the right tune to join to the words, but nothing seemed to fit. On the night before Christmas Eve, he went to bed feeling he had utterly failed. He said, my brain was all confused, but I was roused from sleep late in the night as he said, hearing an angel strain and seizing a piece of music paper, I jotted down the tune. He titled it St. Louis. When, later on, he joyfully presented it to Brooks, he said, I think it was a gift from heaven. The next day, a group of 36 children and six Sunday school teachers sang it publicly for the first time. It wasn't published as an official hymn of the Episcopal Church until 1892. Now, the historian David McCullough referred to this hymn when he told of something that took place during what he called one of the darkest times ever. Shortly before Christmas 1941, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, at considerable personal risk, crossed the Atlantic in great secrecy to meet with the American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The attack on Pearl Harbor had taken place, of course, just weeks before. On Christmas Eve, from a balcony at the White House, the two leaders spoke to a crowd of 20,000 people gathered in the twilight. President Roosevelt pressed a button to light the Christmas tree, then he spoke to the crowd, and by radio the world was listening. He said, our strongest weapon in this war is that conviction of the dignity and brotherhood of man which Christmas Day signifies. Churchill began his remarks. He said, here 
uh, I was in the midst of war, raging, roaring all over the lands and seas, creeping nearer to our hearts and homes. Here amid all the tumult, we have tonight the peace of the Spirit in every cottage and every generous heart. Here then for one night only, every home should be a brightly lighted island of happiness and peace. The following morning, Christmas Day, the Prime Minister and the President went to church where with the congregation they joined in singing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Churchill had never heard that carol before. McCullough said he liked to think of Churchill and Roosevelt in those dark days, singing about the everlasting light that shone in Bethlehem. And as would be said about Churchill, he always sang lustily, if not exactly in tune. Brooks died unexpectedly in 1893 at the age of 58, never knowing how popular the hymn would become in the years ahead. For some reason, the fourth stanza has been dropped from the original score. It reads, where children pure and happy pray to the blessed child, where misery cries out to thee, son of the mother mild, where charity stands watching and faith holds wide the door, the dark night wakes, the glory breaks, and Christmas comes once more. Now, just as an aside, if you are a music lover, you may enjoy looking up the tune customarily used in England. It is called Forest Green and was arranged by Ralph Vaughan Williams in 1906. And looking at that carol, I was struck by the author's choice of words as he wrote how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. The wondrous gift is given. Usually everyone likes it when something is free. Retailers learned long ago that buy one, get one free sounds so much better than half off when purchasing two. How thankful we should be that salvation is offered to us as a gift from God. Now, to better understand this, consider these facts with me, please. Spiritually, we are poverty-stricken paupers. The Bible tells us of our debt and of our destitute, bankrupt condition as sinners. Speaking of even wealthy people, the passage I read to you from Psalm 49 says, none can redeem his brother or give to God the ransom. The redemption of the soul is precious. And literally, somebody has said the passage is saying, hands off, only God can handle this because we are paupers. Do you ever think of how outrageous it is that our debt is not against a mere mortal like ourselves, but against the throne of the universe, our creator, the great Jehovah. If someone asked us whether we were sinners, we would likely admit it, perhaps somewhat sheepishly, but we would admit something along the lines of, uh, yes, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners. But if somebody asked us if we were a criminal or accused us of being a criminal, we would take great umbrage at that insult, as though to be guilty in God's courtroom, a sinner, is somehow less serious than being guilty in one of the courts of this world, a criminal. Sin is described in the Bible as lawlessness, and we have broken God's law. How impious that our debt is not in currency, it's not money that we owe. Our debt is in iniquities committed, vile sins against that law, that government, that God. And we can't remove any of that because we are helpless. Think how enormous our sins are. Who of us could begin to compute the number of his sins? Things that we have done, that we should never have done. Things that we didn't do, that we should have done. Thoughts. Thoughts of covetousness and evil that have come into our mind. No wonder that the question is asked in the Bible, is not thy wickedness great and thine iniquities infinite? We have missed the mark. That's one way God describes sin. We have crossed the line, transgressing, crossing a line between right and wrong. We have failed to listen to God, ignoring his words, and we have fallen short of his standards. I think that all of us run the risk of minimizing our sin. It seems that some people imagine sin is sort of like parking tickets. If you get too many, the policeman may perhaps track you down or they may immobilize your car with what is called the boot. However, if you have just one or two parking tickets, that won't make a big difference. But sin is really like a virulent cancer growing, multiplying, taking over. Major surgery is needed to save your soul because of how terrible sin is. You will remember that in Luke chapter 23, when the Lord Jesus was nailed to the cross, 
The first words from his lips were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They weren't ignorant of their wrongdoing. Pilate, Pilate understood that the Lord Jesus was innocent. Judas confessed, I betrayed the innocent blood. No, no, no. The, the, the people involved, even those who delivered him up to Pilate, did it for envy, not because there was really any wrongdoing. They were not ignorant of the facts of their guilt. They were ignorant of the enormity of their crime, of their sin, that they were leading to death, condemning to death, and attempting to put to death the Son of the Most High God. How grievous then that our debt is of such a nature that we cannot lessen it, but that we constantly add to its enormity this deadly, awful thing called sin. In his book titled The Heat, Steelworkers' Lives and Legends, Jimmy Baca quotes uh, a man named Joe Gutierrez's story about the silvery dust flakes that frequently floated to the floor in an area of the mill where he worked, where steel strips rolled over pads in a tall cooling tower. For years, he said that workers and visitors alike flocked to the site, which was especially picturesque at night, these silvery flakes floating down. And, and at, at night, it was just, it was, as he said, people flocked to see it. Then they discovered that the dust was asbestos. Everyone breathed it, wrote Gutierrez, who now suffers from the slow, choking grip of asbestosis, as do many of the other plant workers. He said, I, I can't walk too far now. I get tired real fast, and it hurts when I breathe sometimes. And then he added these words, and to think we used to fight over that job, to be near where those attractive silvery flakes were falling to the floor. Sin is very much like those attractive silver flakes. Enchanting, appealing, attractive, but absolutely deadly. You will understand how much we need to be delivered from our sins. And yet, we have no resources with which to buy or purchase salvation, no ability to earn or to deserve it. So please allow me to tell you wonderful news, that eternal life is called God's free gift. This is the present, the gift that God is offering. He's the giver. So rather than his being a demanding God, God constantly, generously gives. He gave us the world. One of the psalmists wrote this, the heaven, even the heaven of heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. He is an all-wise creator for seeing the kind of world that would be required to sustain life. And in this vast universe, astronomers and scientists are hard-pressed to find another place where it would be possible for life to exist, let alone for life to begin. But God gave us this planet, the blue planet, then he stored it, stocked it with all the provision that is needed. I love the way the New Testament puts us. He has given us all things richly to enjoy. He is not only an all-wise creator for seeing the kind of planet that would be required to sustain life, but he is a, a faithful creator, unchanging in his commitment to our good. I think it is a remarkable thing that he has given us a Bible, his word, his inspired word, with all of the needed information to show us how to be saved. Mighty forces have conspired time and again to deny you the ability to have, to hear, and to read the word of God. Yet, here it is, preserved down through the ages, telling us truth about God, about Christ, about salvation, about sin, about eternity. Do you know that there was a time when the Bible was available in 500 languages? Then, as I have mentioned influences at work, there was only one language in which it was available. All others had been destroyed. That one language was Latin, the language of the educated. And very, very few people either had access to a Bible or had they been able to find one, would 
certainly not be able to read it. Let me tell you the difference. As of November 2019, the last time I checked, 2,883 languages have all or part of the Word of God, and there were 2,195 projects underway for further translations. What a privilege that you have been given God's Word. Do you realize that since the Lord Jesus ascended to heaven shortly after that, that God has lived in our world. God, the Holy Spirit, sent by the Lord Jesus. Do you realize the, the importance of that? Because such is the darkness of our minds and the lack of interest that sin puts in our heart that if the Spirit of God were not here to turn our minds to thinking about God, we would never, we would never turn to him for salvation. But of course, I want you to think about the fact that God gave his son. What memorable words they are, spoken by the Lord Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In Romans chapter 5, the apostle wrote, scarcely for a righteous person would somebody die. Perhaps for a good person, someone might dare to die, but God displays his kind of love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And along with the giving of his son to be our savior, God is offering you eternal life. This is the gift of God. It is the life required in order to enter into heaven, to exist in heaven, even to enjoy heaven. Apart from having eternal life, heaven would be a place of unimaginable torment to a sinner. It is only when a person is born again and has received this wonderful gift of eternal life, a gift that God is offering to everyone and offering to you tonight, it is only then that a person can enjoy the things that God enjoys. In meetings in Florida a number of years ago, there was a, a very uh, thoughtful woman who was attending and listening, trying to just grasp everything about the message of the gospel. And when the meetings closed, she was reading a book that talked about Calvary and the death of the Lord Jesus. She said that there was one thing that she took away from the two weeks of meetings that she attended. That one thing was that salvation was the most important thing in the world, that to have Christ as your savior was the most important thing in the world. As she was reading that book and what the Bible says about Christ and salvation, she said that she realized that salvation was a gift, a gift. And she said, it just came to me, did I want it? Do I want Christ? Well, yes, she thought, I do. And if he's offering it to me as a gift, I'm going to take it. And she trusted Christ as her Savior. Now, that all may sound very simple, but you must understand the cost that was involved. Calvary. It is amazing that all the cost was assumed by God. The sacrifice on the part of God the Father is conveyed in the parable the Lord Jesus told about the owner of a vineyard and the Lord Jesus said that that man had one son, his well-beloved. God has only one son. God has and has had eternally only one that is the only begotten son of God. And God gave him, as I mentioned from John chapter 3 and verse 16. Think of what that involved, the suffering of the son, the Lord Jesus. Because in that parable where the father sends his, own, his only son to the vineyard, having yet one son as well beloved, he sent him saying, those workers will reverence my son, that the workers, when they saw the son coming, said, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And the inheritance, the whole vineyard, will be ours. God was sending his son into a world that was determined to kill him. And they nailed him to a cross. But something happened on that cross that the world couldn't do, that Pilate couldn't do, that Herod couldn't do, that Centurion couldn't do. He suffered for sins the just for the unjust. The Lord God laid on the Lord Jesus the iniquity of us all, and he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was chastised so that we could have peace. And it is by his suffering, because of his death, with his stripes, the Bible says, we are healed, we are saved. It was his suffering that would purchase this 
gift of eternal life that could then be offered to you free of charge because he would pay the fearful price. I quoted from a missionary's book the other night. Just allow me to tell you another experience that those missionaries had. After a, a busy day of travel, they were sitting uh, near to a, a campfire. The uh, Africans who had traveled with them, they loved to, to communicate in a setting like that. So the fire was blazing and they began to uh, dance around the campfire singing. And the two mis missionaries sitting over here talking, one of them suddenly realized what was being sung. And he said to the other missionary, listen, listen to what they're singing. I'm not going to try to quote to you the African words, but the translation as the two missionaries sat there listening, they realized that the significance of the words were those Africans were singing, and I suppose singing about their enemies who might hurt them, make him to suffer, just as they made the son of the infinite one to suffer. Make him suffer, just as they made the son of the infinite one to suffer. And the missionaries went to them when they were done singing, and they said, where did you learn such words like that? make him suffer as they made the son of the infinite one to suffer. And the natives answered, the song was handed down to us from our elders who learned it from their ancients. We, 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 we don't know who this Moana Kalunga, the person in the song, the son of the infinite one, we don't know who this Moana Kalunga was. They said, do you know who it is? Yes, they said, we know. We know who the son of the infinite one is. We know the one who suffered and they told them about Christ and his cross. The son of the infinite one suffered on a cross to buy, to purchase eternal life for you, and God is offering it as a gift. Think of the suitability. Perfectly meeting our deepest needs for this life and for the life that's coming, for earth and for eternity. Psychologists tell us that as far as well-being is concerned, that humans need three things. It can perhaps be simplified this way. First of all, there has to be a person, someone in our life, someone to love and be loved by. I, I have read more than one occasion where uh, elderly couples died within moments of each other in nursing homes, that they'd be holding hands and, and one would die and in the next few moments the other would die. Loneliness is deadly. Friends, family, and relationships are essential. But as we noted, the greatest relationship is with the living God whose unconditional love brings security and peace to the human heart. Apart from personally knowing God, life seems empty. So a person, and then a purpose, something to do or a, a cause that makes life significant and meaningful, the sense that our lives count for something in the, the grand scheme of things. And apart from this link to the noblest of causes, life seems to have little meaning or goal beyond our own lifetime. Notice the appalling rate of teenage suicides, the hopelessness spawned by the teaching of Darwinian evolution, the nihilism descending on so many lives. As someone has said, many poor souls, many poor souls live in million dollar houses but there is a terrible poverty because there's a, a lack of purpose in life. The ultimate purpose is to be linked with a king who's going to reign forever and a kingdom that will never end. And that, that is a wonderful segue into the third thing. Not just that there must be people, a person that we can love or be loved by and a, um, a purpose, a reason for living and, and to make my life count in uh, the matter of something that is lasting and enduring. But there must be a prospect some hope to look forward to. Eternal life gives the believer the assurance of a heavenly home and future. And I would go so far as to say that apart from this eternal perspective, everything else seems fated for a shallow grave, but to be looking forward to spending eternity with Christ when life is done, what a wonderful prospect to have before you. Years ago, after his very well-known London gospel meetings, Billy Graham intended to head to Scotland for a holiday just to recover a few days. But on the morning of May 25th, 
he got a surprise call. Could he come to visit with Prime Minister Churchill? Mr. Graham wrote that when he got there, Churchill seemed to uh, be in one of his dark moods. He said, we talked about the state of the world, and Churchill added, I am a man without hope. Do you have any real hope to tell me of? Now, whether he was talking about the world or himself personally was not clear to Dr. Graham. So Billy Graham asked him, are you without hope for your own soul's salvation? He was trying to find out, was the prime minister asking him about the world or was he talking on a personal level? Are you without hope for your own soul's salvation? Churchill answered, frankly, I think about that a great deal. Graham pulled out his New Testament and told Sir Winston Churchill about God's wonderful plan of salvation, that the grace of God was offering salvation to him as a gift. If you are like the statement that was made, a person without hope, if you trust the Lord Jesus today and receive his gift of eternal life, you will have the brightest hope of all, the future of living forever with him. How does a person get it? Who's the recipient of this gift? Well, it happens at conversion because each one who receives the Lord Jesus receives this gift. And this first points to the indispensable moment of conversion when you read the gift of God as eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as I close, please allow me to tell you, this gift has been fully purchased. It's the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Don't say you can't get it when it's already been purchased. This gift is being universally offered. The Bible says that the grace of God's salvation bringing to all has appeared. Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So don't say it's not available when God is offering it to everyone. This gift can be presently possessed and has to be personally received. Please don't say it's not possible to know for sure when the Bible says he that believes on the Son has everlasting life, has eternal life. This gift will be eternally enjoyed in the presence of God, in the presence of the Lord Jesus forever. The righteous will enjoy, he says, life eternal. Don't say you don't need it because we're all on the way to eternity. And without this gift of eternal life, you will perish forever. You, you desperately, urgently, vitally need this gift of eternal life. Because this can be tragically ignored. The preachers Paul and Barnabas met people who, in their words, judged themselves unworthy. They, they weren't interested in everlasting life. So please don't say you'll think about this later. This is for you here now, tonight. I grew up, I was born and raised in the city of Philadelphia, and my uncle worked for a department store there. The, it was called the John Wanamaker Department Store, and Wanamaker's had a number of department stores all along the East Coast. And by the way, it is John Wanamaker who um, created the concept of prices for items. Prior to this, you would bargain with somebody, and if you were a better bargainer, you'd get something for less money than the next person who couldn't bargain as well as you. But I'm about to tell you how John Wanamaker became a Christian, and he felt if we're all equal before God, then we should be all equal before price. So the same price for everybody. John Wanamaker attended a gospel meeting. He heard a 70-year-old man tell how he was saved and add that he was near the end of the road and salvation was good to die with. Mr. Wanamaker was just a young man, and he thought, well, that has a little bearing on me. But he said, then a young man got up, and he told how he was saved. And he added that salvation was great to live with, but as well as to die with. And Wanamaker asked himself, if I were in a court of law and heard statements like I have heard, would I believe them? Yes, I would. Do I ever intend to become a Christian? Yes, I do. Well, he thought to himself, why not now? Here are his words. I didn't wait to get a feeling. I accepted the fact that I was a sinner and that there was a savior for sinners Please listen. I came to that Savior simply on the proposition that the gift of God is eternal life. I came to the Savior simply on the proposition that the gift of God is eternal 
life. Here's the Savior's promise, that if you trust him and receive this gift, you will never thirst, you will never hunger, you will never perish. I think that had the Savior said, we would not perish, which uh, are his words in some cases, but in what I'm quoting, if he had said we should not perish, we might infer that the word never, we might infer the word never from his words that we would not. But the Lord Jesus removes all doubt by saying, I give to my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. This is eternal assurance, eternal security in the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Trust him tonight. Receive that gift and begin to enjoy everlasting life. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we bow in thy presence, asking thy blessing on thy word. We are thankful for each one who has joined us. Grant, Lord, that the uh, eyes of their understanding, as thy word speaks of, may be opened to see the truth of God's great gift of eternal life. We ask thy blessing, giving our thanks in the Savior's worthy and precious name. Amen. What a wonderful gift. Just what every man, woman, boy, and girl requires. We were reminded that we don't deserve God's gift. But God's giving is not based upon just desserts. Not like Santa Claus who is making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice. Now the gift of God is available to all who want it. And it's free to us, but very costly to God. He gave his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the death of the cross, where our sins were laid upon him, his Son, and he bore them willingly, so your sins could be righteously forgiven. But the question that must be asked, do you want it? God is not willing that any should perish in their sins, so we plead with you, as the scripture says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. If you would like more information on what you've heard, please visit our website at ottawagospelhall.com, where you'll find many useful resources. Also a contact page where you can leave contact information if you wish, and someone from the hall will get back to you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Please come back tomorrow night when the contemporary carol, Mary, Did You Know, will be featured. Good night, and God bless you.